Welcome back to Spiritual Fitness. My name is Kanini and here at Spiritual Fitness, we unlock the secrets to a long, happy and successful life. So this has happened to me in the past and I hope that you find this message at the right time so that you don't cry tears off. <laughs> you don't cry tears off. So sometimes you meet somebody that you like and they are just a great fit for you. You are happy together. They make you happy. They make you laugh. They are playful, everything. And then you start worrying, anxiety. They're not calling you enough. They're not texting you quickly like you would want them to do, you start thinking that they are losing interest in you. And they are probably just doing everything normal, trying to take it slow so that they don't make you panic. For you, it brings in anxiety because you fear being abandoned. This is an attachment style. And if you want to learn more about attachment styles, you can get this book by Amir Levin. It will explain to you what is happening to you, why your attachment style. When you are anxiously attached, it means that when you are growing up, your early caregivers would leave you for some time, letting you know that they've gone and they'll probably take long to come back and you would get anxious. When they return, you're very anxious the next time that they leave because you don't know when they're going to come back. Now that you're a grown up and you're four Falling in love, this anxious attachment style gets activated whenever you fall in love. Instead of just relaxing and letting, letting this love come, you become more anxious because that's your love attachment style that has been triggered by your nervous system. This mind can ruin your relationship because it has activated the survival system of your body, the sympathetic nervous system. This sympathetic nervous system, we use it to either fight people or to run away from problems and since you're not under threat or under duress you're going to fight or drive your partner away because that's the work of this nervous system what you need to know is that you need to stay calm you need to know that you're fine and safe i'm going to give you the quickest way in this video of how to get to feeling safety Don't fall in love. Get out of love. <laughs> oh, do what do you mean, Pastor John? If you meet somebody and you're almost becoming a bit obsessed, you're kind of thinking about them all the time, waiting for their next message, dying to see them again, and just constantly checking on them, we as human beings tend to label that as we must be in love. But the reality is that kind of behavior is signaling that they are either triggering your anxieties in a way that you it leaves you insecure and worried, or you have a fear of abandonment. You have a fear that this relationship's not going to work because you've experienced abandonment before. Hi, me. It's me. It's probably I'm. All of you who fell in love, you fell into trouble. Good morning. I'm conceited. Sometimes I literally will think to myself, my future husband, whoever he is, is so lucky. Like, he'll get to spend the rest of his life in my presence. What an honor. I will cry at the altar just because I'm so happy for him. Modern women in a nutshell. That's why men are not getting married anymore. <laughs> When it comes to the ministry of love, when it comes to the diversities of love, you must understand where scriptures point that we love and how love is to be dispensed. They did a qualitative study where they actually asked black men why do they believe that black women are the least desired group of women, the least likely to be married, and the least likely to be remarried? You know what I think? I think it's because of our weaves we it's because of our hair we like wearing weaves and wigs and men don't like that i've heard so many men say they don't like the wigs and the weaves maybe that's why <laughs> i don't know so well let's find out why <laughs> and and the very first answer mm -hmm. the black men said it's black women's attitudes it's black women's attitudes what the masculinity, the emasculation, the, the, the being stubborn, being difficult, being combative. No desire to be interdependent or submissive or cooperative or friendly or sweet. So, so they're talking about character flaws within black women as a community that they see that is so prevalent that it's generalizable. I mean, it's me, it's probably me, I'm a great, uh, 
a lot of the, the things that we were raised on were by parents that also had their own different trauma. So for them, they were telling us things in order to protect us from mm -hmm. what they went through. So all these women that are my age, we were told, don't worry about no man. Go to school, go get your job so you can take care of yourself. You just need to get an education so you don't have to depend on a man for anything. And what that did was create a whole generation of women that I don't need a man for nothing. I don't need no man because that's what we were taught by a generation of women who were going through things and had all these kids and they couldn't leave even if they wanted to because they didn't have any money to do it. So then they taught them that. My prayer is that this generation, we grew up looking at our kids saying, mm, yeah, I don't want you to have that trauma. Mm, no, I don't care what happened with me and your father. I want you to have a happy marriage. Men are turning these women into your enemies. How can you expect her to work just as hard as you, come home, nurture the children, cook for you, have sex with you, still be feminine, still feel soft, still be well-spoken, and still have her mental all together? You're asking for too much. And a lot of you don't even realize while your mothers were raising you by themselves, they were having mental breakdown after mental breakdown after mental breakdown. Now you don't even talk to your mother. Oh, I don't talk to my mom, man. You know, my, my mama crazy. No, 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 no. Your father was crazy. He left her with you. She stayed and handled all her business. So now everything she talks to you about, you take so personal. You have no right. To be upset with your mother. How many marriage proposals do you expect a group of women who have consistently proven themselves to be intolerable, insufferable, combative, masculine, unsubmissive, stubborn, know-it-alls, who create drama and conflict? Do you expect our fault finder binoculars where we examine people and we look them over real good? How many of you are good at finding the flaws in people? You know, I have a God-fearing, loving, faithful wife who has taught me so much about family. I'm from a broken home. Seeing her consistency in, 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 in really running the household while I'm out hunting, understanding the importance of family. And, you know, I protect her, I love her, and I provide for her. And, and, and you, they talk about the roles we, we have no but that doesn't mean one role is more important yes i'm the breadwinner but my children are winners because of my wife and the type of house she's established if you don't understand what the word of god says about love you will not be able to understand how to apply love how to utilize love and the boundaries of love you see, we all are capable of loving because we all emanated, we all emerged, we all came from the image of God. We all came from God and God is love. So an aspect of every human creature is a latent, inherent deposit of God's nature called love. I wish that people in general, but especially black men, understood that a lot of the times our anxiety as black women shows up as irritation or aggression, but we are not necessarily angry. We don't, we, ne we never really get that past to be like, you know, you hear about white woman tears, but when a black woman cries, she's looking for sympathy. When a black woman is irritated or has an anxiety or is overwhelmed or is overstimulated, she's with an attitude. When a black woman needs help, she doesn't get help. So when we go out and get the help that we need to get, then we're too masculine and we shouldn't have done it anyway. We need to depend on the same men that say that we're not desirable. So I just wish, I wish we uh, as a culture dived more into the mental health. And trauma release, which you've been seeing, is the biggest part of our society coming up, especially over the next two years. Trauma work starts from within and it's required that you actually take action yourself. If you're waiting for someone else to heal you, it's not gonna work. This is a time where you have to actually go inside and start working and doing the work yourself. How you wanna measure that you love someone and they're right for you is how much they soothe your anxieties. How much do they bring you peace, calm, and safety when you're- It's not capacity. The primary reason that people are stuck in trauma is not because they can't heal from trauma. I love what Dr. Peter A. Levine says. He says, human beings are born with an innate capacity to triumph over trauma. The issue is not capacity, 
The issue is that the conditions for your body to heal itself are not in place because you're either in a one-on-one -on -one with the symptoms that are actually biologically correct for the state that you're in, or you're talking about past childhood trauma, which is actually not going to do anything except make you feel worse. Trauma is not a past event. Trauma is your brain perceiving threat in the here and now where there is no threat and your body preparing to address that threat. What we need to focus on is not getting the symptoms to shut off that are biologically correct for the state you're in, not talking about some past event. We need to convey safety to the nervous system via the body in real time repeatedly until your brain is convinced that there is no threat in the present. We press in to God with our trauma. We, we take it to God. We cry out to God. We talk to God. We might even complain to God about it. Prayer changes things. Stop overthinking it. Stop overthinking it. Worry is pride. <laughs> you know why? Because really it's me saying, if I think about this long enough, I can solve my own problem. I'm gonna find the answer to this. And God does not want us to be independent. He wants us to be dependent. So the first thing that he needs to hear when we have a problem is, God, I have a problem and I know that I am not smart enough to solve it without your help. So please help me. And if there's something you want me to do, show me what it is. And if you want me just to wait on you to do something, then help me be patient and wait. And this is what Paul did in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you don't know the context of this chapter, he had something that he called a thorn, and we don't know what the thorn was. Scholars guess all these different things, but it was a thorn that was tormenting him. It seems to me that almost everybody has a thorn. Raise your hand if you have a thorn. Raise your hand if you have a thorn. Type online if you have a thorn. Some of you, yes, type online. I, I have a thorn. Type online, I have a thorn. Some of you right now, you have a thorn. Some of you, you're sitting by your thorn. <laughs> Don't elbow your thorn right now. That would not be polite to do in church, but it seems like all of us have that something that we wish we didn't have in life. What you think is your weakness, God would always use as your strength. I was telling Pastor Taylor, when God called me into ministry, I was insecure because I was like, God, my voice is very, you know, sometimes like my brothers used to make fun of me. They're like, you sound like a kid. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't, I just, that's just how I am. And the Lord is like, yeah, I'm going to use that. And it always amazes me when it's highlighted. And I just want to share this with you that whatever you're looking at as your weakness, you need to have a weakness for God to be attracted to you because his strength is made perfect in our weaknesses and so if you're counting yourself out and you're like God I can't do this because the very thing you're saying is your weakness God says how else am I supposed to show my glory if you don't have a couple of those and scripture says Paul did this he said three times I pleaded with the Lord I begged him to take it away from me. Most scholars would say this wasn't like just three little prayers, it was very likely three seasons of ongoing prayer when notice that he didn't blame God for the thorn. But he took his thorn to God and he prayed and he pleaded and he begged in the very same way you can take your hurt to God and you can take it to him again and you can take it to him a third time and you can unload on him and say, God, I don't understand. Why did this happen? Why did you let this happen when you could have perhaps stopped it? You can tell him, it's not my fault. I don't know what to do, God. I don't even know how to heal. You can totally and completely be honest with him. Don't hold back. He can handle it. Scripture says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. You take your burdens. You give it all. You give him your praise. You give him your thanksgiving. And you give him your hurt from your heart, God. Please take it away. Three times he pleaded with the Lord and God responded to him. And God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, God says, is perfect in your weakness.
Truly love yourself, you must first love God. You can't love yourself first and then love God. You have to love God first because when you love God, you will see yourself the way God meant you to be because now you are seeing yourself through the eyes of God. In Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. And like Joyce Meyer says, it's the lack of humility to ask God for guidance in your relationships, to ask God for help in your, in your affairs, in your work, that brings in a lot of anxiety. A prayer to God can ease your pain. Reading a Bible verse can ease your pain and put you back into homeostasis and restfulness. But a lot of people are too proud to do that. Say a prayer, read a Bible verse, get assurance from God that everything is okay. What this will do is that it will make you feel more calm. It's going to make your mind calm and it's going to make your body calm because the body also follows the mind and what's going on here so if you believe in god and his love and his ability to carry you through and for his ability to protect your relationship then you have nothing to worry about a lot of people are proud very proud and i hope that for you because you want this relationship and you want to be happy that you find the wisdom in dedicating your family and this new love and relationship to god because this is just a relationship that's beginning over time you will need a f may probably to make a family or you will need to have a, a big relationship with god because of the things that you want into your life you want god to protect you when you're having children you want them to be protected by god in their endeavor you want them to feel safe and the first place that you start is you feeling safe in this universe in this big, big world, if you don't feel that God is protecting you and you think that your own abilities are the ones that are going to give you love, money, and riches, good luck to you. But if you're humble, just know that God can see you through this relationship as it begins and that he knows that you need love in your life and he wants to help you find love in your life. The big question is, will you let him? If you like this video, please like, subscribe and share. Again, my name is Kanini and this is Spiritual Fitness and until next time, may God